Okay, so uh, before I start, I uh, maybe I'll just make a couple of remarks. The uh, the first remark is is regarding you know this uh, this observation uh, re regarding you know obtaining the variation of the inclusion exclusion formula from the original one by exchange, uh, exchanging the rows of the unions and the uh, intersections and uh, VJ and John has looked into it and the. Uh, I think they, they already have uh, more or less found the answer. You know, you, you apply uh, De Morgan's law and observe that's the, uh, uh, the this, uh, that's the number of unions on the left hand side and the number of the uh, intersections on the, on the uh, I mean that the number of unions and the, and the intersections on both sides are, are balanced. Uh, so this seems to be a crucial uh, observation and uh, it may well be true that for a set additive function and the identity has this balanced uh, situation. I don't know. So I mean, it, it seems to be on the right track. Yeah. So uh, part of the mystery is resolved, I, I suppose. And the, um, so I also talk about Yeah, let's also talk about uh, this theorem, okay, uh, which says that if you just throw in any number, non-negative number on the atoms, you can always realize uh, realize it. Uh, so actually, the the question, if you just throw in any arbitrary number, uh, the the question is the same as uh, characterizing uh, all entropy functions gamma n star. This is actually how how I, I started to think about the problem, right? By looking at the picture, I ask you know what numbers are valid and what numbers are not, and then um, toward the end of the last part, I uh, I give you an example of uh, proving the bladed processing theorem by inspection, and uh, I just want to uh, mention that this kind of uh, diagrams are awfully uh, useful. As a matter of fact, I, I did my PhD thesis on, the, on, on a multi-terminal source coding problem, and uh, in the thesis, I need to prove some converse coding theorems. And by drawing some, you know, uh, uh, some very simple diagrams uh, by inspection, I was able to tell which way the inequality should go. Okay? Although when I wrote, wrote out the proof, I wrote it out in another way, because at that time, there was no, uh, uh, no theory for this yet. Okay? Okay, now comes the second part of Markov structures. Okay, so this is a, a motivating example. Now suppose we have a, um, a, four, a length four Markov chain, x1, x2, x3, and x4, okay? I mentioned that the, uh, the, the, the I-measure mu star always vanishes on these five atoms. So uh, let's take a close look at that. The first atom says that you, know, you take a complement on two and four, okay? So let's look, take a look at, uh, uh, at this. Okay, this corresponds to crossing this out and crossing this out. The second atom, uh, you, you take a complement on two, so you cross out this. Okay. And then uh, for the third atom, you uh, complement two and three, so you cross out these two guys. Okay. And for the fourth atom, you, uh, you take a complement of three, cross out this guy. And the uh, the third, uh, the fifth atom, you cross out. Uh, you take complement of one of one and three, so you cross out these two, these two guys. So uh, do you do you see the pattern already? Okay. Separators. Uh, yes. So it turns out that the, uh, at, least, at least for this example, the the vanishing atoms are exactly those uh, such that by removing the corresponding uh, nodes that are complemented, okay, the the remaining graph becomes disconnected. Okay, so we are going to build on this uh, this theme, All right? Uh, but before we talk about you know Markov uh, random fields, I'll talk about a uh, a more generic structure, okay? Uh, which I um, uh, I, I call conditional. Uh, I mean, uh, 
Okay, first talk about conditional mutual uh, independence, and then we'll talk about something called full conditional mutual independence. Okay, now suppose we have uh, three random variables x, y, z that are mutually independent, okay? So the information theoretic characterization is that the uh, joint entropy of x, y, z is equal to h, x plus x, y plus x, z, okay? So now let's take a look at this, uh, the first diagram. So because uh, they are mutually independent, they are always um, uh, pairwise independent. For pairwise independent, we have uh, x independent of y, y x independent of z, y independent of z. So we have uh, this diagram here, uh, because it, the, 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 the guy in the middle can be negative, okay? Uh, actually, actually, I mean, the, uh, in this particular case, the, uh, because x is independent of y, so the, uh, uh, the mutual information between x and y must be equal to zero, which means that this, uh, the, the two atoms, uh, the, mu st the value of mu star on the two atoms must add up to zero. We know that the, uh, this guy here is a, is a conditional mutual information. It cannot be negative, so we, we, we call it A, where A is a non-negative number. If this A, then the middle guy must be minus A. Okay? The same thing, if this guy is minus A, then the, this guy must be A, and this guy must be A. Okay? So, so if we uh, just consider pairwise independence, we impose the structure. Okay? Uh, furthermore, if we, uh, uh, we consider Y being independent of the pair X and Z. So this means that if Y is independent of uh, X and Z, then we have I, Y, X, Z is equal to zero. Okay? Which means that the, if you intersect Y, with the union of x and z, you get uh, these these three guys. Okay, so these three guys are a, a, and minus a, and uh, if they add up to zero, then a must be equal to zero. Exactly. Okay. And therefore, uh, with this, you force all these uh, all these four atoms to zero. Okay. So that's just uh, example one, showing that you know under certain situation we can force uh, uh, certain atoms to zero. Okay. <laughs> right. Another example. Um, X and Y independent conditioning on Z. So uh, we have actually have seen something like this before. There's just a Markov chain, and then we, we force this, uh, this atom to zero. Okay. Now, let's take another look at, at this example. X independent of Y. If X is independent of Y, then uh, the intersection of X and Y must be equal to zero. So this is, uh, we, we call this A, this must be, must be minus A. But they are not necessarily equal to zero. Okay? So in this case, we, we are not able to force any atoms to zero. The question is why. Okay. Now it turns out that um, uh, there's a reason for that. And the, let's see. OK, so let's take a look at this theorem. Although uh, this slide is a little busy, but I'm going to uh, explain this with a picture. So we, uh, let me, uh, I'll just read this through. Okay, let T and QI be disjoint index sets, and WI be subsets of QI, okay? And I from one up to K, where K is greater than or equal to two. So um, assume that uh, there exists at least two I's such that um, WI is non-empty, okay? So WI is a subset of QI and at least two of the WIs are non-empty. And uh, suppose we have... Uh, Can you draw the picture? Yeah, I, I'm going to draw a picture, okay. Uh, and then um, assume that uh, conditioning on XT, all these XQIs are uh, mutually independent, okay? Then uh, WI being a subset of QI, uh, we will have uh, w, X of WI being mutually independent. Conditioning on XT, and also xqi minus wi. Okay. So the picture is like this. So we have, uh, suppose we have a, a Markov situation conditioning on this, all these uh, blocks of variables are uh, mutually independent. Okay. Now, uh, wi is a subset of qi. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, I mean these in this in index indices are just all disjoint. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and at least two of these uh, WIs are non empty. Then the WXIs con are mutually independent, conditioning on all these things in the, uh, that are shaded. So, this is uh, 
This is actually a rather, tri uh, a tr rather trivial observation. Okay. Why do you need non-empty? Oh, because if, 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 if only one of them is non-empty, then, then you just end up having one guy, and you cannot, it cannot be mutually independent. Yeah, it's a, suppose uh, only this guy is not empty. All the other guys are uh, are empty. Okay, these are guys are empty. So so they're all all shaded, and uh, there's only one guy here. And you cannot talk about. Uh, yeah, but in that case, I mean, you can simply call your assume that if it is empty, then it's a specified constant. So constant is always. No, no, no. I mean the uh, we can you cannot say that uh, uh, this guy is uh, mutually independent conditioning on the rest. You cannot say that. Because if this, if only this guy is not empty. Okay. So what I'm saying is that if you originally have uh, uh, all these blocks of variables, uh, mutually independent conditioning on this, and uh, uh, you will have all these white blocks uh, continue to be conditionally uh, 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 continue to be mutually independent, conditioning on all the shaded variables. Okay. But you must have at least uh, two of these guys which are not empty, otherwise you cannot say that. Yeah, no, no, but, but there's only one thing in, in, uh, here, I mean, there's only one thing, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this, 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 this is clear intuitively, okay. Now, okay, now I'm going to talk about something called uh, full conditional mutual independence. Okay, so, um, so now again, again, it's important to fix n. Okay, so we have, um, we consider. Sorry, you said it's not trivial, that statement. I mean, this is. Oh, uh, this statement is trivial. I mean, uh, it's. it's it, it, no, no. Okay. Uh, this is r r uh, relatively easy to show. Okay. But intuitively, it, it is clear. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to introduce uh, a notion called full conditional, uh, uh, conditional mutual independence. Okay, so a, a conditional mutual independency on uh, x1 up to xn is full okay, if all the random variables are involved. Okay, and uh, if so, we, we, we call this an FCMI, the full conditional mutual independency. Example, uh, for n equals 5, okay, we first have to fix n. If you don't fix n, you cannot discuss this. Okay. Uh, x1, x2, x4, x5 are mutually independent conditioning on x3. We call this uh, an FCMI, okay, full conditional mutual independence, because all the five random variables are involved. Whereas the, this one, x1, x2, and x5 are mutually independent condi condition on x3, it is not FCMI, because x4 is not involved. Okay. Now. Uh, okay, so we call this uh, notation. Okay, I, I, this is um, one of the central uh, concepts. So I put it on the on the blackboard. All right, so, uh, and then we consider a non-empty atom in the field, okay? We fix n, and then the non-empty atom has the form y1, y2, uh, y1 tilde, intersect y2 tilde, all the way up to intersect yn tilde, and where uh, one of these yi's must be, uh, what, these yi's uh, is equal to yi tilde or yi tilde complement, and one of them must be uh, at least one of them must be uh, 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 must be non-complemented, okay? And uh, so I'm going to introduce this notation: U A for the atom A, be the indices that uh, the, the set variables are, are complemented, okay? So uh, again, we're going to use this notation again and again for an atom A. OK. 
Okay. So uh, it is clear that if I tell you A, then you can tell me U A, and if, you, if I tell you U A, you can tell me A. Okay. All right. So uh, again, we uh, we take a look at this uh, variation of the inclusion exclusion formula. Okay. And the now this guy here is uh, if you just take the uh, here if you this is just the uh, you, you think of this as an atom okay the inner these are the non non complemented variables and all the complemented variables are here okay and then by by looking at this uh, you see that you know the uh, the value of mu star on an atom can be written uh, like this okay it's a uh, linear combination of the conditional entropy of uh, some J, where J is in UA complement conditioning on UA. Okay, because now this guy, the B, is actually plays the role of UA, because uh, these are the complemented variables. So uh, UA is always complemented, okay? and, uh, and then these are just subset of the, of the rest. Okay? So this is actually an, another form of, uh, of, of this uh, variation of the inclusion exclusion formula when it is being applied to, uh, to an atom. Uh, here. Okay. I don't really understand this notation because UA is just a set. UA is just a set, right? So, I mean, what does it mean to have uh, uh, conditional entropy given a. Oh, I, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a bad notation. Uh, it, it should be X of UA. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. This is X of J. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, did, I didn't uh, uh, spot this. Okay, so. Um, all right, so, the, um, so now we consider uh, T and QI, I from 1 up to K, be a partition of the set of all indices. And then we uh, use this notation, uh, T semicolon QI, okay, defines uh, a FCMI on the x1, x2, up to xn. Okay, just an, it's just, not, just a notation. Okay. So it defines a... Um, an FCMI which we call K, and K says that XQ1 up to XQK are mutually independent conditioning on XT. Okay, so we are going to use this tuple to denote uh, this FCMI. Okay. okay. Now the, uh, and then I'm going to introduce to you um, a very important set called um, image of K. Well, K, K is just this guy here, okay? K is just this tuple, which denotes an, an FCMI. And I'm going to introduce to you this set called image of K, which turns out to be the, uh, all the atoms that are forced to zero by that particular FCMI, okay? So, the, uh, now, again, this slide is, uh, is, is rather busy, but I will show you a picture to illustrate that. So, uh, so we start with uh, this, k equals t, q1, q2, up to qk. Okay. This means that the, all, all these uh, set variables, are, all these random variables, corresponding random variables are mutually independent conditioning on this one. Okay. So, now given this, the, the image of K is um, given as such, okay? The image of K uh, has this form. Uh, so this is an, an atom in the image of K. So it says that uh, you take the intersection of xj tilde, where j is in some wi, as, as before wi is, is uh, some subset of uh, qi, okay? And, uh, and then you subtract from this uh, the t, okay, which is the conditioning set union all the things that are in QI but not in WI, okay? And uh, where WI is not empty for at least 2I. Okay? So in terms of a picture, it looks like this. So this is uh, uh, the T and the Q1, Q2 up to QK, okay? And then we, uh, a, an atom in the image of K has to swap. You take uh, subsets of the Q of the, uh, of the QI and call this uh, WI, and at least two of them are non empty. Okay? And then you take the, uh, uh, for, for these things, for those uh, uh, set variables in the WIs, you take the non complemented form. 
for all the rest, you take the complemented form. So this is what I'm saying is that an atom in image K has this, uh, has this form, has this general form. Okay, this, is, this gives the, uh, the detailed description of a formula uh, uh, of an atom in image of K. Uh, but, but actually, image of K can be visualized uh, more clearly uh, by means of the following two propositions. So uh, the first proposition says that, uh, let's say we have only two Qs, uh, Q1 and Q2. Okay. So conditioning on T, uh, the, uh, Q1 and Q2 are uh, uh, independent. I mean, I mean the corresponding random variables. Right? Then the image of uh, K has this form. The image of K are all the atoms uh, that are in this set. Okay? XQ1 tilde intersect XQ2 tilde minus XTQ uh, uh, tilde. Okay? So, uh, so it means that you Q1 and Q2 are disjoint uh, index sets. Oh, these are the, the these are set variables. I mean, the, the corresponding set variable. Uh, the indices are disjoint. The indices are disjoint, but the sets are not disjoint. So, uh, so if we have, uh, uh, yes, I'm going to give an example here. So T. So we have suppose we have this. Okay. Then the uh, image of K is equal to uh, all atoms in this. Okay, and it's x q one tilde and it's x q two tilde minus x t tilde. Okay. Now this is the case for uh, K equals two. That there's there are only two. Q's, okay. For, uh, when you have more than two uh, uh, two Q's, it turns out that you know the uh, the image is the set of all atoms in this union. Where this union, uh, okay, this union c consists of uh, uh, different I's and J's. So you just take uh, two I and J, you take the intersection, and then you subtract this from uh, subtract it from x uh, uh, from it x t tilde. And then you just take the different uh, choices of I and J, and then you take the union of all of them. Right? So let me give you an example. So, uh, so this is uh, K. Uh, the T is equal to empty. Okay? So this says that X1, X2, and X3 are mutually independent. Okay? So for, uh, uh, for this one, we need to take uh, subsets from these sets. Okay, and we uh, we need to take at least two non-empty subsets. Okay, so if you take uh, uh, one, two, and three, all all of them, you can take uh, the subset being one here, the subset being two here, and the subset being three here. You get this atom. If you uh, take this subset, this subset, but if this subset to be empty, then you get uh, uh, one bar, two, and three. And if you take a uh, this subset non-empty, this subset non-empty, but this subset empty, you get one, two, bar, three. And then if you take uh, this subset, this take an uh, empty subset here, and then you take these two as non-empty subsets, then you get one, two, three, bar. So it corresponds to these four guys here. Okay? And uh, as an illustration of this, okay, so this is the, uh, the the set consisting of these four atoms is actually equal to the union of x1 intersect x2. That's this guy here. And the union, uh, the intersection between x2 and x3. That's this guy here. And then the uh, intersection between x1 and x3. Okay. So you take the union of the intersection between two Q's. Okay. And uh, so that this here we uh, the T is empty, but uh, when in case T is not empty, you just subtract T from everything else. So, um, so another example, uh, T is equal to four, and uh, we have a conditioning on four, we have one, two, this collection independent of three, okay? So because uh, uh, T is four, we have to 
complement T in every of these atoms. Okay? And then out of this, we can take, uh, uh, there are only two Qs here, and we need to take uh, a non-empty subset from this guy and this guy. Okay? So this, this is a singleton. We need to take uh, three all, anyway, so th three is always there. Okay? For one and two, there are three non-empty subsets. Uh, namely one, two, uh, two, and one. Okay? So these are the three atoms in the image of K. Is that clear? Again, uh, you can see also see that uh, the the set consists of these these three atoms are just the uh, uh, the set one two intersect with the set three minus the set four. Okay. But we need a detailed description of the atoms in order to be able to operate, okay. and and the detailed description of the atoms are given by, uh, by, by, this, uh, by, the, by this formula here. Okay. okay, so uh, this is the punchline for this part of the uh, tutorial. This theorem says that let K be an FCMI on X1, X2 up to Xn. Okay. And uh, oh, recall that in we, I gave three examples. In the first two examples, I the Markov condition or the independence condition was able to force some of the atoms to be zero. But for the last one, uh, it doesn't force any of the atoms to be zero precisely because it's not an FCMI. It's one of the uh, random variable is missing. Okay. So uh, so this theorem is, is about uh, FCMI. So let K be an FCMI on X1 up to Xn. Then K holds if and only if mu star of A is equal to zero for all atoms in the image of K. Okay. So we have seen some uh, simple examples of, it, of this, and this holds in general for any FCMI. Is there any reason you call it image instead of kernel? Uh, instead of kernel? Kernel. Uh, I just wish, uh, think of it more visually. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now this is uh, the pr there's a proof in, in chapter 12 of my book, uh, but uh, the year before, T. Liu, who is going to give a talk this afternoon, uh, visited INC and he he uh, took interest in this in this stuff, and he was actually able to uh, to simplify simplify the proof. So last time I gave a tutorial at the Australian School of Information Theory, I I presented this proof due to T. Liu, but for this uh, time, because I want to put in some recent results, I don't have time for that. Uh, I think we are going to post the slides, right? We can. We can, but uh, the, the only problem is that I, uh, this is, uh, well, I think the animation is very minimal. This should be okay. This is Keynote. Right? So uh, I, I'll try to convert it into uh, PDF before posting it. Right? So we'll skip this. Okay. Now, the, the one, one very important thing about this, um, the, uh, this image business is the following. Suppose we have a collection of FCMIs. Okay, we, we don't just have one FCMI. Let's say we have a set of random variables and they satisfy a collection of FCMI. And uh, we know that for each FCMI, they, uh, it forces a certain subset of the uh, atoms to zero. What if they, uh, we, we need to, them to hold all together? It's very simple. You just, uh, Take the union of all these images, and they have to be zero on on, on the union of of the, of the images. So you, you think of the Im, the image set being kind of like a transform, okay? In the in the transform domain, you know, when you uh, um, impose all these uh, FCMIs uh, together uh, simultaneously, then the, the the union, I mean, the images just take the union. Okay. So this is actually a. Uh, uh, so, so the, the next theorem is just uh, just trivial. Uh, for an, uh, you just define the image to be uh, the union of all the uh, individual FCMIs, okay? And then the, this theorem says that if you have a collection of FCMI called pi on this uh, collection of random variables, then the uh, pi holds if and only if mu star of a is equal to zero for all a in the image of pi, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at uh, an, an application of this uh, uh, of this result. 
Okay, now, um, in probability theory, this is a very elementary problem. We are given a set of um, conditional independence uh, condition, and we ask whether they imply a certain conditional independence condition. For example, we are given uh, x1, x2, and x3, okay? And then uh, we know that x1 is independent of x2, and in this case, we know that you know it implies x1 is also independent of x3. Okay, I'm talking about, about this kind of problems. Okay. It's very elementary. When the, in fact, um, when we were looking at the uh, uh, characterization of, of the entropy functions in the with uh, with Jun Zhang in the in the 90s, I sent a preprint to Imer Hissa, and he linked me up with uh, Faro. Okay, because uh, at that time, you know. Uh, Farrell was uh, working uh, um, on this type of problem, which he called a p-representability p problem, which is a more general problem uh, in the sense that uh, you know you just list for n random variables, you just list out all the possible conditional independence uh, condition, and then I want this to be true. I I don't want this. I want this. I I don't want this. Want this. Want this. So on and so forth. Any arbitrary pattern. He asked whether this is achievable or not. Okay, and uh, when I first learned about this problem, I thought, gee, this problem is such a simple problem to state. Okay? I thought it must have been, uh, it must have been uh, uh, solved 50 years ago. It turns out that I was wrong. Okay? At that time, you know, uh, uh, Matush uh, uh, and also uh, Farrell, Matush, and uh, your, your colleague, uh, Stas, uh, what's his first name? Student, Milan. Uh, Milan, Milan Studenti. Okay? They were able to solve the case for three random variables. But uh, uh, they were still working on the, the case for four random variables. So from what you told me, okay, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. So we heard the problem from Judah Pearl. Yeah, it came from. Uh, uh, it came. Uh, yeah, they they were looking at it from uh, uh, from the point of view of Bayesian networks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a very elementary problem, but um, it is extremely difficult. Okay, so uh, the the more general p represented. P representability problem, which I stated here, was uh, settled by uh, by Farrow in 1999 uh, uh, with a non-standard type inequality. Okay, but beyond that, uh, beyond that, the, the problem remains open. Okay, so one one thing I would like to note is that why why is this related to non-standard type inequality? Because this problem of characterizing uh, all possible uh, conditional independence. Uh, is a is a sub problem of characterizing uh, this region gamma n star, which is the the set of all uh, uh, entropy functions, all achievable entropy functions. Right? Okay, so uh, one application of this is the following. So so this problem is, is in general very difficult, but it uh, but if you confine yourself to FCMI, it becomes very extremely easy. Okay? So uh, let's say we have a two sets of FCMIs, pi one and pi two. Then pi one implies pi two, even only if uh, uh, the image of pi one is a superset of the image of pi two. Because uh, if pi one holds, then you force everything here to be zero. And if this is a superset of this, then 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 pi one implies pi two. Okay. So uh, so this is uh, I, mean, I mean the if part is straightforward. The the uh, only if part actually uh, invokes theorem 3.11, which was the theorem's state, uh, saying that uh, if you have if you have an information diagram, you just throw in arbitrary uh, you know um, non-negative numbers, it can be realized. So the good thing about this is that you can uh, you can control which atom to be non non-zero okay, with with this construction. Okay. So I'm not going to go through the details, um, but I, okay, and uh, corollary is that two set of FCMIs are equivalent if and only if the images are identical. It turns out that, you know, two sets of FCMIs can look very different, but they can be identical. You just have to look at the, the images, okay? Uh, so this is a completely graph theoretic characterization of FCMIs. So uh, with this, you can forget about probability. You just look at uh, set theory, okay? So, uh, as an example, let's say we have uh, four random variables, and we have uh, two collections of FCMIs. Uh, the first collection, pi one, is uh, k1, k2, 
and the second collection is K3, K4. Okay. So we just uh, take a look at the, the images. So for uh, K1, this is the image. Uh, K2, this is the image. So you just take the, the union of, of, of all these things. When you see two dots, it's the same thing as having one dot. Okay. And uh, for K3, you have this. And uh, for K4, you have this. So uh, a close inspection reveals that this is a super set. OK, so, so what, what it boils down to is that you know, uh, all these atoms are being forced to 0. And a close inspection here shows that uh, pi 2 implies pi 1, because uh, this, this, the set of 0 atoms here is a superset of that, with this being the extra one. Okay, this is 0, and this is not 0. Yeah. Okay. So very easily, you, know, you can show which one is stronger. And uh, if they are not, uh, if they are not, uh, uh, if one of them is not a subset of the other one, uh, neither of them is a subset of the other one, then the, then their examples you can easily construct examples showing that you know, they don't actually imply each other. Right? Okay, so uh, mark of random fields. So, yeah. Uh, yes. They, they had uh, uh, algorithms for, for oh, right. this kind of, of implication. Right. Yeah, I know about that. Uh, in, in, in your theorem, you need to go over 2 to the n of atoms and, and identify which are 0. It, it's, it's a lot of. Uh, lot uh, of right, but, uh, but the. There should be something more, more effective. Yeah, but this is not close, but, but what they obtain is not closed form. Yeah. So yeah, you, you have yeah, yeah. There, there, there is an algorithm. Okay. If you input this and then you, with some rules, you can uh, um, uh, arrive at uh, which one is uh, implies what. Yeah. But uh, but it, it's not a closed form uh, characterization. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. That's that's the that's the main difference. Yeah. So. Um, yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Actually, it was referred in in, in my paper. Yeah. I I, did, I didn't mention that. Mm. Um, well, at least it works very well for 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 yeah, uh, for, yeah. for this context. I don't know. Uh, there could be. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, let me see. So maybe I, I I'll go on for uh, what time is that? Uh, maybe I I I'll, I'll keep talking for about uh, ten fifteen minutes before we take a break. Is that okay? Uh, you have still eight minutes. If you have ten or bit more. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we are going to talk about uh, Markov random field in this framework. Okay. All right. So uh, just graph some graph theory uh, terminologies. We let uh, g equals v e. Uh, this is an undirected graph with no loops, and uh, v is a set of vertices and e is a set of edges, as usual. And uh, okay. So uh, this is a notation that I'm going to use from time to time. So let u be a uh, a a subset of nodes. Okay, and the components of g slash u. Okay, g slash u. Uh, I, it is the is the graph denoted. Uh, is the graph obtained by removing the node u and also all the edges um, attached to u. Okay, and the components are denoted by v one of u, v t, v two of u, all the way to v s u of u. So this s u is the number of uh, components in the in the uh, graph upon removing uh, the, the nodes u. Okay. So if s of u is greater than 1, we say that u is a cut set in g. Okay. All right, so uh, this is a mark of this. Is g connected to begin with? It uh, doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this is the definition of a uh, mark of random field. Uh, so uh, I'll go through it, and then I'll explain to you what it is. OK, let's let g. In the GPA uh, undirected graph, okay, with uh, we we use uh, this as the, in the indices for all the vertices one two up to n, okay, and we let x i be a random variable corresponding to vertex i. Uh, the random variables x i i in V form a mark of random field represented by G. If for all cut sets u in G, the sets of random variables, you know, uh, as such, these are the those in the components. 
uh, mutually independent conditioning on XU. Okay, so, what, which, so what it means is that you have a graph and then you associate with each, uh, uh, with each node a random variable. And if the condition independent structure is consistent with what the graph tells you, then we call this a Markov, chain represent, uh, Markov random field represented by the graph. Okay. Specifically, uh, suppose we have, a, uh, we have a graph like this. Okay, so I x one two uh, one two three four. So uh, one two three is a cut set. So from this graph, we must have uh, x one independent of x four conditioning on x two and x three. Okay? So everything we you can read off from the graph must hold. This is what uh, uh, the, uh, this is the definition of a, of a Markov random field. So uh, some remarks uh, regarding this definition. Uh, so, uh, if we have a Markov random field represented by G, we also say that you know these random variables form a Markov graph G. Okay, I just borrowed the term Markov chain. Okay, and uh, yeah, when G is a chain, we say that they form a Markov chain. Okay. So, so Markov chain is a, is a special case of a Markov random field. Is G directed or undirected? Uh, undirected. Undirected. But can you say G is a chain? A chain. Oh, okay, I I'm not using this for a. In the, yeah, I, 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 I'm, this is not very standard um, graph theory on page. I just call this a chain. Right? Okay. Yeah, it, it, just like a. Yeah, is there a name for this this thing? Pass. Path. Path. Yeah. Path. It's like a path. But a path can also mean something else, right? No. No. Okay. 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 Good. Thank you. Okay, now in the literature, this definition is actually called a strong Markov property. Okay, uh, this is opposed to the weak Markov property, which says that uh, uh, for, uh, for a for a um, let's say you have a on a graph, you have a certain node, and then you have a the neighborhood. Okay, the weak Markov property says that uh, if you are given the neighborhood of of the random variable, then this random variable is independent of uh, of the rest. Okay, so so weak a weak Markov property is a uh, is a special case of uh, uh, is weak. I mean, strong Markov property is stronger because you, in a weak Markov property, you you take this as, as your cut set, okay, and then you consider only a single node uh, inside. Okay, uh, So if the underlying probability distribution is strictly positive, uh, you know, it's well known that the, the distribution can be rep represented as a Gibbs measure, which is a special form of a, of a, of a joint distribution, which is uh, specified by the graph. The under the latest assumption, namely the under the assumption that the uh, probability distribution is strictly positive, the strong Markov property and the weak Markov property are equivalent. Okay? But if there are some zero probability masses in the joint distribution, then the, the weak Markov property is strictly weaker than the strong Markov property. Okay. In this uh, uh, discussion, we, we use the, the strong Markov property as the definition of a Markov random field uh, for the reason that uh, things work. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, now the, the here we, in, in this definition, we don't uh, require the, uh, the joint distribution to be strictly positive. Okay. When the joint distribution is strict, is, uh, con uh, consists of some zero probability masses, things are very problematic. Okay. Uh, 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 Farrell knows this very well. Okay. So the, if you have a, uh, let's say you have a uh, joint distribution which is strictly positive and there are certain you know, Markov structure, and as you take the limit uh, to a distribution with, uh, that contains a zero probability mass, then the whole thing can fall apart. The continuity does not hold. Okay. And therefore, in the uh, I think I believe for this reason, the most of the literature uh, in Markov random field are about Gibbs measure. Okay? They stick with the paradigm that the, uh, uh, the 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 underlying distribution is strictly positive. Okay, and uh, if the underlying distribution is not strictly positive, I I'm not even sure whether it uh, there is a general closed form for the joint distribution. I think it is seemingly impossible. If you know that, please, uh, please let me know. Okay, now so. So at this point, it seems that you know, uh, uh, 
non-strictly positive distribution is a no man's land. Okay, it, you can't even write down the uh, the general form. Uh, the question is whether you can still say something about it. It turns out that you can. Okay, it, it actually doesn't really matter whether you can write it in closed form or not because in the information theory tools that we employ uh, don't care whether the uh, joint distribution has a zero probability mass or not, which is the, the, the power of, of information theoretic tools. Okay, okay so uh, here are some applications of um, Markov, Markov random fields, and I'm no expert in, in, in any of them. Uh, originally, it was uh, studied by a uh, physicist you know, uh, uh, for ferromagnetism. Okay, the easing model and things like that. In the um, in the eighties, it was very popular because of uh, its application to image processing. Okay, and uh, recently, it, and then it died down for uh, like uh, 10, 15 years. And recently, it's coming back because uh, of its, its uh, application in social networks and also in big big, big data. Okay. okay. So the, the reason why I talk about FCMIs before Markov random field is, that is because uh, Markov random field, if you adopt a strong Markov property as a definition, it is just a collection of FCMIs. Okay? So, uh, so we are going to use this notation. So, each, so each, uh, for Markov random field, each concept U in G specifies an FCMI on, on the set of random variables, which we denote this, this uh, FCMI by square bracket U. Okay? This FCMI says that conditioning on XU, uh, all these component uh, random variables are mutually independent. Okay. And uh, we introduce this, this notation when we consider more than one uh, FCMI at the same time, we use this logic code N. Okay. So if, uh, if this uh, and this, all these things have to um, Satisfied together, we just use this notation. Okay, u one comma u two, so on and so forth. Okay? And in this notation, uh, if a collection of random variables form a Markov graph G, uh, then this is necessary and sufficient condition. Uh, so this is u. Okay, this is u in the. Uh, I'm, I'm using this notation here. Okay, so this is the collection of all. A subset u of v. This is a subset of uh, uh, nodes, and u not in v, such that the uh, uh, u disconnects the graph. You know, I mean, uh, s of u is greater than one, means, meaning that if you remove the nodes in uh, the nodes u, then you disconnect the graph. Okay. So this is just the so a Markov random field represented by G is equivalent to the collection of all these FCMIs. Okay, and I. I, I use this notation u g square bracket. Okay. okay so uh, all right. So now I'm going to introduce uh, two types of atoms. After this, I will uh, I'll take a break. Okay. So uh, recall that uh, a non-empty atom A has this form. Okay. Y one tilde y two tilde up to y n tilde. Okay. And uh, we Use this notation U A to denote all the uh, indices such that the Y I's are complemented. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, here are the definitions of so-called type one atom and type two atoms. There are two types of atoms. Okay. So uh, let G be given. Now for a non-empty atom A of F n, if S U is equal to one, that is uh, G. Uh, after removing U A, it still remains co uh, connected. That, that is a, so. For an, for an atom A, you have the U A. Okay? For an atom A, you have the U A, and you have those indices where where the uh, where the set variables are complemented. And then you remove those um, uh, corresponding nodes from the graph. If the if after re removing this these nodes from U A, okay, the graph remains connected. We call this a type one atom. Okay. Otherwise, if you, uh, upon removing all the nodes in U A, the graph becomes disconnected. We call this a type two atom, okay? and uh, we denote them by type one G and type two G, uh, uh, respectively. Okay. Now the uh, the the main result here is that okay. Now the uh, you look at this. The Markov random field is just a collection of FCMIs, and uh, to characterize this, you just take the image of all these FCMIs. 
and, and take the union, okay? And that will be it, okay? So the, the result here is that, uh, but because of these images in, intersect with each other in some complicated ways, okay? But it turns out that after taking the union of all these images of the FCMIs uh, 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 induced by the graph, it turns out that it is exactly equal to the set of all type two atoms. Okay, so this is the, the main result. So it means that the image of, uh, of, all, of the, all the FCMIs induced by the graph is exactly equal to the set of all type, type, two, type two atoms. Okay. So, uh, so I'll take a break here.